so let's get started. So we're going to do a bit of a one-two, quite informal, nothing could possibly go wrong. So um, let's just start by, t tell us a bit about the review and its findings and what action you're taking. Yeah, well, as we said, it, it's in the bag, so I'd recommend that everybody reads it. Um, the work that was done involved uh, a number of uh, in-depth sessions with uh, what we'd see as pretty sophisticated advertisers and their agencies, uh, and uh, some advertiser uh, roundtables uh, as well. Um, I think the thing that we found was that the, you know, the, the big actions that we, that we highlight in the document, uh, which are about well, making advertising welcome in people's lives, prioritizing effectiveness over efficiency, uh, really being focused on the visibility of your ads, making sure that you measure their, their, their impact uh, and that you deploy resources uh, to make that happen. are very easy to say, um, but they're much harder to do. So the real challenge in, in thinking about this was not so much the what do we write now, it's what do we do next. Uh, and there was talk about uh, creating a charter and trying to turn this into some kind of movement. And I felt, well, certainly some of us felt that this was, you know, another charter was about the last thing that the industry needed at the moment. Uh, and in terms of... Um, practical implications for advertisers and members. The only way you could really uh, uh, get the benefit out of this was to have somebody lift the hood for you and take a look at uh, well, how well it was working in your own, um, in your own backyard compared to, compared to that of the best, which is where we came up with the idea, or I say, well, actually, our members came up with the idea of this health check, uh, which we then creatively turned into the MOT. You, you know why, you know, ISBA is, is not uh, an advertising agency. Um, so that's what we have. So we have uh, an ISBA uh, ad experience uh, MOT coming up. Uh, the idea is that that will give you a good snapshot of uh, what, um, where you are relative to the best, what uh, needs to be done, um, areas for further investigation, some of it you might do yourself, some of it you might need uh, further help on. So uh, I think the thing that most struck me when we set out on this, this work, when the actions came back, was that it was rather heartening to see the and surprising, really, to um, see effectiveness come out as being a, uh, a much more important priority than efficiency. So I think when we sat down at the beginning and said, you know, the only, the only way we'll get people on this bandwagon is if there's money in it for them. Uh, and the, the, the hypothesis when we started was all about, um, it was all about wastage uh, and being able to eliminate that through excess frequency. Um, uh, and I know Direct Line emerged as one of the high performers in the review, and, and largely, as, you know, as partly as you've just heard from Sam, you know, through the relentless uh, focus on, on effectiveness. Well, why do you think that is? Any, any thoughts from you? Yeah, so um, if I just go all the way back to the beginning when we started the research, the great work that Credos did in Stephen's team, Advertising Association, it said that trust in advertising at its lowest ebb. Um, the reason I took this conversation very seriously is that this is an existential risk for all of us in this room. Um, if advertising is the medium through which brands build trust, if that medium in and of itself is getting less and less trusted, then that's a big problem for all of us. So I think it's something that I felt was needed to lean into. And then through some of the working group actions, um, we uh, formulated a list of quite tricky questions for Mediacom, who are uh, our media agency, to understand this issue of excess frequency and bombardment. And what was most interesting about the response was we have 200 clients, none of them have asked any of these questions so far. So it is the Wild West at the moment in terms of managing frequency. And we are burning the attention span. You heard the 5,000 ads and the goldfish attention span from Raja, um, 5,000 ads a day. So we are burning the attention of, uh, of our consumers. Um, so I think that's an important thing to say up front in terms of the importance of this issue. If I relate to Direct Line, well, Sam's already said a lot, but I'll just tell you a little story that happened a couple of months ago to put it in perspective. So we have a good graduate scheme. We have people rotate around the business. Uh, I meet all of them as they come into the team just to be friendly and say hello. And, and a, a nice chap came in from procurement, a trained accountant, and uh, I said, how did you feel about coming into marketing? And he said, well, honestly, I was quite nervous because I was rubbish at drawing at school. Mm. In, in fairness, he nearly did a really good save by saying, I've been super impressed by how data-driven and analytical it all is, but you know, frankly, it was, all, it was already a little bit too late. Um, but uh, so, I mean, this is about the fact that the job of making people believe that marketing is not a colouring in function is never done. And it, it really hacks me off, because I'm an economist by trade, and I hate that slight. 
uh, and not least in insurance, which is a numbers game. And if Pete's still here, wash your mouth out with soap and water, Pete Markey. He's worked in insurance. It's a brilliant industry. Right now, we're helping thousands of people who have had their flights cancelled for coronavirus, hundreds of people who have had their houses flooded through uh, Kiara and Dennis. So, I mean, I, actually, I think there's a lot to say for insurance. But anyway, the point is, marketing was at the front of the cuts queue. So every year, everybody's budgets get challenged. Uh, to hit year-end numbers, to hit quarterly milestones, whatever it was. And marketing was the easy place to go and the first place to go. Uh, and so I was very determined to build, basically build a campaign whereby we would get to the back of the cuts queue. And that the, from CFO to CEO, all the operational MDs, etc., would appreciate the added value of marketing mm -hmm. spend. And the only way to do that is to prove it and prove it consistently because the job to convince people it's not a colouring function is never done. And so through, you know, all of, for all our great successes, three IPA goals, loads of awards, massive increases in effectiveness, blah, 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 blah. The biggest single one is that we're not cherry picked at the front of the, at the, front mm. of the cuts queue. Mm. So, um, so yeah, I mean, that's probably the, the direct line. So I mean, Sam said a lot more, so I don't want to repeat, but I think it's become as much of a, a philosophy mm. um, just to the extent that one of our rooms on the marketing floor is called ruthless commerciality mm. and we had, we had a little bit of a problem actually because the fca came in for a meeting and they thought that meant we didn't care about customers but anyway different story <laughs> so you've demonstrated it's really good for the business and we've focused so far on how it can be good for the business of the buy side for advertisers and agencies what do you think are the implications of this work on the supply side for media and for platforms say yeah, so it's, it's gaining prominence as a conversation and days like today help in that. And I think the supply side really needs to lean into this. And, and my, you know, my main call out to the big advertisers in the room is to not settle, have really high expectations, particularly of your media owners and the supply side. And I think the supply side is not okay to abdicate this until we have a world of cross-platform measurement. It's just not okay. Uh, uh, we had an example in the working group of somebody who... Um, had figured out, stitched it all together, a bit of manual work, to say that one of their ads was, had a, a frequency of 200 impressions across all platforms. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's no, um, lots of good advertising in the world, but there's no advertising that's good enough to tolerate that level of frequency. Uh, and so I think you know, it's, the supply side's got to have a, um, the interests of their clients and their brands uh, really genuinely held to understand it's not okay to say, well, I can't measure it, so I don't care. It just here's my ideal frequency for you in isolation of everything else. But I, but I think it's coming. You know, the, the work that we're seeing here, the, what, something Sam's mentioned, the work that Ubiquity are doing, I think everyone's waking up to this is an ecosystem I need to manage, and I've got to see the whole. Yeah. Otherwise, I'm literally wasting money, and that dot, dot, dot will undermine my credibility internally as a marketing function. Um, but, but still a long way to go across media cross-platform measurement is kind of the holy grail, but we can all play a role in advocating for it. So, so it's a big challenge. So my question back to you is, um, you know, very subjective one, Phil, how, how optimistic are you about real change? Well, I think I am optimistic. I mean, for a start, I think on the supply side, um, you know, it's in the interest for the supply side because of their users, readers, viewers, however you want to define them. Uh, if they want to have sustainable brands, uh, they will need to be thinking about this a, a lot harder some than they have in the, in the past. Um, but I do think this is one of those things that won't happen overnight. Um, movements have to start somewhere. I am really pleased by some of the progress we're, ma we're making on some of the enablers and, and fundamentals and by the fact that the industry conversation has moved to a very different place from the way it was certainly three years ago and, and, and even, even a year ago. So... As you've said, though, ultimately it's only going to be going to happen if people see it to be good for their business. Yeah. Um, I, I think one of the things that we have most um, uh, scratched our heads over collectively in, in the sessions we've had has been how we start to take this message, though, from uh, the, preaching almost to the converted um, and to people who come from a brand-driven background to those who have a more performance-driven um, mentality, some of them digital natives, um, and I'll be really interested in your thoughts on, on how that will play out. Yeah, I mean, I think it is an interesting thing, isn't it? You know, we, we, we all need to be sort of cool and trendy if we want to live in the world of marketing, and, 
uh, fear of missing out is pre very prevalent. I, every trend has a counter trend. I saw so, something, the joy of missing out the other day, you know, in terms of people cancelling meetings and uh, meeting up with people to have time back. So, but the point yeah, is, yeah, we yeah, are... The joy of missing out on some of our speakers. <laughs> there you go. That's another story. Um, so the, the, the fear of missing out thing means that we're quite faddish as an industry. Yeah. Um, and, and a reference point was I, I helped set up something called the School of Marketing, which is to help people from all sorts of backgrounds into the industry. Uh, and uh, at one of the sort of mini conferences we held, um, they, there was a failure to recognise that the people, the people in the room saw themselves as anything other than digital marketers. Mm. I'm a digital marketer. And I said, well, aren't you a marketer? And they said, no, I'm a digital marketer. And they couldn't see that there was a difference. Um, and so the, I mean, the, the work you've just seen and, uh, you know, highlights that all that glitters is not gold. There's more to it, and it is an ecosystem. So I, mean, I think there's something about, um, you know, don't, don't turn our back on what's uh, the, the old-fashioned stuff. And for senior people in big uh, advertiser client-side um, companies to, to hold that balance and help to educate people coming through that marketing is a whole ecosystem and they're, they're not digital marketers, they're marketers. And actually, I think the MOT will help in that because it will ask some of the questions. Mm. It'll be really interesting to see how native digital advertisers can get their heads around some of these questions. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, de it's definitely a thing. There's a perception that um, TV is dead, uh, despite, you know, Ritson and Ubiquity and Game Theory and all the work that we've done, specifically amongst people who self-classify as mm. digital marketers. And it's a, it's a big problem because clearly all that glitters is, is not mm. gold. Um, and loading it up uh, is just really not a, a sustainable strategy. Mm. So um, we talked about the MOT. What, what's the one thing people can do? MOT is probably the obvious answer, but you know, what, what should they do, do with that? How are they going to use it as a tool? Well, I think, I think the first thing to do is, is take that MOT um, and um, get to grips with what needs to be done in your own environment. Uh, a lot of this, I think, can be done uh, with self-help rather than with the um, help of expect, uh, expensive consultants. But the MOT is intended to try and uncover where the, where the priorities are. Um, uh, and I think, um, you know, ask, in the first instance, ask yourself the questions that are, that are posed in the, in, in the document. Um, you know, we've talked about you taking the MOT, even though Direct Line is you know, right up there, we would say, as one of the, the, better, as one of the top performers. I mean, do you, why don't you tell me a bit why you, why you think you, you're up for that? Yeah, so if this was used being framed or Ant and Dets, I think I'd take away, I'd, I'd say, no, I'm not going to do it. But, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Uh, that, but, would, that would be given, the end of my day. Given that it isn't, uh, <laughs> yeah, of, of course we'd be doing it. And I, I suppose it's, it's partly a philosophical thing. Well, first off, practically speaking, it does ask some quite tricky questions to self-help. Um, and, you know, and it doesn't come with expensive mm. consultancy fees. Uh, but for, for us to do it, even though we, we think we might be ahead of the pack, the philosophical point is to never believe that you've sussed it. And, and that comes from the fact that the media landscape is changing so fast. But the, the, the metaphor is one of uh, elite sport, that you're, you're most vulnerable when you think you're winning. Yeah. Because cr as cracks emerge in your thinking or capability, uh, they can uh, increasing and improving performance can cloak the fact that those cracks are becoming bigger and bigger. So, yeah, absolutely we will be taking the MOT because... This is something, this is such a crucial part of having a commercial marketing function mm. that it's inescapable that we would want to do it. We'd want to do it first and we were wanting to get a competitive advantage over our, yeah. our, our peers, to be, to be frank. Um, so, yeah, I'm, and, uh, you know, we would obviously, and I know the Advertising Association and all the joint industry group that have been working on this would say, this is the moment to double down on efficiency and effectiveness, particularly effectiveness, and here's a tool that can yeah. help you to do that. Uh, so... Um, what would good look like? So how, how are we going to measure whether this yeah. whole initiative is, uh, is been worth it? All right. Well, look, I'll answer this question, then I'll move back to the stage and I'll, I'll finish us all, all off. But I, I, for me, I don't think it's, all, it's about a number. It's not about the number of MOTs that we, we, we manage to get out there in the course of the next year. More than anything else, it's going to be having a really solid bank of case studies and testimonials from big and serious businesses that take the MOT and say, as a result, here are the benefits that we, that we, uh, that we uh, accrued. We may not be able to publish all of the, the numbers, but I think for people to be able to say this was good for our business and it was good for our customers uh, in a year's time would be um, a, a major step forward. 